2 Kings chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and we'll finish together on verse 8. Let's read these verses responsibly. And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. <clears throat> and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee. For the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come again to hear from you. So, Lord, we ask that you speak to us, that you instruct us from the preaching of your word, that we might be helped and strengthened and drawn closer to you. As we ask that you meet with us today and for your will to be done, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> There's something taking place here. Elijah is the man of God, and here's where we get the term, he is about to pass the mantle. Uh, what we stopped short of reading is a whirlwind came and Elijah was carried up into heaven alive. And as he went up in the air, his mantle fell and Elisha picked it up. <clears throat> the mantle represented his authority as the man of God and his power as the man of God. And he had folded it up and he, he smacked the river with it and it, it split open. And they walked across to the other side on dry land. When Elisha picked it up, he's on the other side of the river. He's on the wrong side. He needs to get back. And so he smacks the river with it. It opens up again. He walks back. And there was 50 preachers in training. It wasn't that their dads were preachers. They were the, the preacher boys, the, college, the Bible college students, and uh, that, had, that had followed them that far and were watching the whole event. And it kind of uh, let them know, okay, Elisha picked up where Elijah left off. God's stamp is on Elisha, and, and that was a, a leadership position, and <clears throat> Elijah was specifically leading Elisha here. I always get these mixed up, and, and uh, so if I do, um, when, whenever you preach, you get it perfect, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyhow, please bear with me in, in my imperfections, but uh, so... There, there's, and it's interesting here because there's three different locations that are specified. Now, Elisha has been following Elijah for some time now. This wasn't the first day they'd been together. And, and so there's, but there's, so he'd been with him here, he'd been with him there, he'd been with him went north, he went that way. When he went south, he went that way. If he ever went west, he went that way, east. All around, he's been all over. But here's three very specific places right in order in, in a very specific sequence, in a very short period of time, we're going from one place to the next place to the last place. And, and I got to looking at that, and, and what I found was there's some significance to these places. And so we, hear, we have here the man of God leading somebody who has dedicated themselves to the service of God, and that should be every Christian. It's, well, I'm not going to be a full-time uh, uh, pastor or full-time evangelist, well, you should be a full-time Christian. If you've been 
uh, born again, blood bought, saved, you're on your way to heaven and there's nothing anybody can do about it, you should be a full-time Christian. Not just on Sunday or, or one or twice a, a month or once or twice a year, and, and, uh, but tomorrow you ought to be a Christian. And you ought to live in such a way that others around you know there's something about them, uh, that, that there's something real in their life. Not just somebody who claims to be a Christian. <clears throat> the Spanish church that my dad was, uh, was working with and building in uh, Fayetteville, <clears throat> most of the men were military men. And they've got uh, uh, Fort Bragg there for the Army and Pope Air Force Base. And, and it's, it's interesting, if you've never been on an Army base, you'll be on the Army base for quite some time before you even know you're on it. Uh, because the, the highway is a four-lane highway, two lanes going in, two lanes going out, and all of a sudden you're on the base, and there's, you wouldn't know it. There's no change in the highway. There's no nothing. Now, an Air Force base is different because it has a landing strip. They have to have a, a guard. They have to have a gate. It's a, it's a, and I think Army base may be a little bit different now after 9-11, but we were there before then. And uh, one of the men said, let's go, let's go, uh, we'll give you a tour. And they got us onto the Air Force Base also. And, but uh, he, Dad told me about one of the men in, in, his, uh, in his church there. Um, uh, <clears throat> had told him, he said, you know, when I was in basic training, he said there was a lot of us that, that said we were Christians. And he said, uh, finally, we, we got to the point where we got to a certain point and they were going to release us for uh, Friday night we could go into town. Saturday we could go into town, and, and uh, so everybody was getting ready. They were they were just getting themselves, uh, uh, I don't know, prepared for some fun. And all these fellows that claimed to be Christians, they went with everybody else to the bars and and all the other places that they went, the dance halls, and I don't know where all. He said, but I stayed I stayed there in the barracks. I stayed on base, and I there was nothing for me in that activity and uh, and this happened time after time that they got they got I don't know what the right word, leave is that the right word uh, I think of shore leave and, and think that's Navy that's not Army don't mix those two uh, so they got they got leave they got uh, uh, here you have some freedom and and he wouldn't use it the way the others the whole rest of the, the guys he was with wouldn't use it the way they did and um, Nothing ever, ever was said about it until they got their deployment orders. And the papers came down and said, you're going to Iraq. We're going to war. And you're going to be in it. And he said, all of a sudden, just out of, out of left and right, he said, men were coming to me and asking me about salvation, about eternity. And he said, here's all these other guys that had claimed to be Christians, not one of them got asked a thing. He said, but because they saw a difference in me. They knew that for that, for the other fellas, it wasn't real for them. He said, but they saw that it was real in my life, and they, they made fun of me, they mocked me all the rest of the time. Come on, you got to come with us, don't you? You're no fun, and you're just a stick in the mud, and they called them names there. Until their orders came in, you're going to war, and then they wanted, they wanted something from somebody that they knew this is real. What we're facing now is real, and this guy has something that's real, and we need what he has that's real to face this thing that we're going to have to face that's real also. So I'm saying that to say we're supposed to be full-time Christians. And God gave the man of God to help lead the people that have decided to be full-time Christians. And Elisha said... You have something that I want. And, and Elijah said, well, what do you want? He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. And he said, well, if, you, uh, if you're there when I leave this world, you'll have it. And so he said, why don't you wait here? i got to go over here. He said, oh, no. <laughs> I'm following you. And so he got over there, and, and the, the Bible college students at that Bible college said, you know, he's, he's leaving today. Uh, God's going to take him away from him. He says, I know. Settle down. And then they went to the next one, and they, they came out to me, and they said, you know, God's taking him away today. He said, I know. Just shh, don't, don't worry about it. And they finally went to the last place, and, 
And 50 of them from the last college said, I want to see this. And so they cross the river, and sure enough, God takes him away, and, and then he comes back. But he's, it, he said, I'm not going to miss it. You have something that I need to face what I am going to have to face. I need something from you. And so there's a the pastor or the preacher, uh, the man of God, and like, has... We have a, a lot of jobs, and I said, this is one of my jobs, and this is one of my jobs, and there's a whole lot, there's a whole lot that people think is the job of the pastor that isn't really. Uh, and, and uh, you know, he might do those things, but not because it's his job, it's because he has the time and, and the opportunity uh, and the wherewithal to do it. Um, but it's not necessarily the pastor's job to paint anything. And well, it's the pastor's job. Uh, I, I remember uh, Brother Hiles talking about uh, the church he was in, in in Texas. Outgrew their building. They they built another building, and they had set an opening date. Here's our grand inauguration uh, in this building, and uh, they got there, and there was no pews. I mean, they're holding their first service in this new building because that was the date they were to have their first service and no pews. And the deacons said, if he would have let us do what we're supposed to do, this wouldn't have happened. And so the next Sunday, he had, he had bags and bags and bags of groceries up on, on the platform. And he said, I want all the deacons to come up here. And... Uh, uh, so they all came up and they thought they were going to get some special recognition. And he had a list of all the widows in the church. And he said, now, this bag right here, he said, I want you to carry it to this widow lady over there. And this bag right here, you're to carry it to this widow lady. And, and uh, so they did. They distributed all the food to the widows. And he said, now that the deacons have done the only thing in the Bible that they were ever required to do, we can get on and nothing bad will ever, nothing no mistakes will ever happen again. <laughs> now, he said, I don't know if I should have done that. I probably shouldn't have done that. But he did. Um, but people got worked up. He had taken on the responsibility of there being pews. And yes, he had, he had uh, uh, not succeeded in doing that. But really, that wasn't, uh, you know, pews or no pews. That's not what makes a church. And you can still have church with people, everybody standing up. And you can still have church with people sitting on the floor. And you can have church with people standing up outside or sitting on the ground outside or leaning against a tree or climbing up into the top of the tree. None of those things is what makes the church a church. But, but listen, there's a lot, I said that to say, there's a lot of expectations that get put on the pastor that you won't find them anywhere in the Bible. Maybe he will do those and maybe he'll, he'll do that. But it's not that he's required to do that. Uh, it's out of uh, friendliness or kindness, or and sometimes it's not that he doesn't do it because he's not un because he's being unfriendly or unkind. It's he simply doesn't have the time, doesn't have the wherewithal. He has a previous uh, uh, thing that he's been committed to. But so so here's some here's three things, and I'm not saying that these are the only three things uh, that a pastor has to do. But here's <clears throat> here's three main things. And you may hear a sermon and say, I wonder why he preached that. And the answer might be found in one of these things. There's one of the things that, that the pastor is supposed to do is to lead the people. And there's three different places at, at, listed in this uh, portion of Scripture that, that we read to where the pastor's supposed to lead you. And the first one is Bethel. Bethel. Uh, <clears throat> and so the man of God wants to lead the people of God to three places. The first one listed here is Bethel. In verse 2, And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went to Bethel. He said, I'll follow you to Bethel. And by the way, if the pastor is supposed to lead you somewhere, you're supposed to let the pastor lead you somewhere. That's two things. If, if God commanded... God's people to go into all the world and make converts and baptize them, then the commandment to the convert is to be baptized. And so you, you, I can't be obedient if the person that got saved is not going to be obedient. And so, so Bethel is the first place. I wrote out next to that uh, Genesis 
chapter 35, verse 15. So if you'll turn there with me, Genesis chapter 35, and, and if you had bookmarked it before the services like I did, you'd find it a lot quicker. Uh, but fortunately, Genesis is in each book to find. <clears throat> but Genesis 35 and verse 15, And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. Now the word Bethel means house of God. House of God. And Jacob says, you know what? That's where God spoke to me. And so, one of the places that the preacher is to lead the people is to the place where God's going to speak to them. And, and the name of that place is the house of God. It's my job to encourage you to be in the church services, to be in the house of God, because the Bible says the church is the pillar and ground of truth, the house of God. And so, that's one of my jobs is to encourage you. I'll preach it from time to time on being faithful to the services and, and to all of them because this is one of the places where you should recognize that's where God speaks to me. And as long as this book is opened up, you have an opportunity to hear from the very words of God. So far, I've read words from the Word of God. If you haven't, God didn't speak to me. Take the cotton out of your ears. You should have heard him say that Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him Bethel. Those are literally God's very own words. And I'm just reading them to you. They're not my words. I'm giving you his words. You should have heard already that uh, Elisha dedicated himself to follow his preacher. And his preacher led him to a place that's called Bethel, the house of God, the place where God speaks to you. Now, if this book is never opened up, I wouldn't... I would say there's a good possibility you're not going to hear from God. And there's places that call themselves churches and they don't bother to open up a Bible. They don't even have a Bible in the entire building. Or if they do, it's from two or three generations ago and they wouldn't use it if they found it. You know, one of the, one of the there's a lot of sad statements in the Bible. We, we read one uh, just Wednesday night where Jesus is outside of the church and He's knocking on the door and asking to be invited in. That's a very sad, sad statement. Um, and and uh, another sad statement was when they, they were cleaning up and rebuilding the temple because it had not been used. The, the country had gone into idolatry and they found the Word of God that had been gone and lost for years and years and years. And glory to God, they were excited at having found it and they brought it to king, the king and they said, we found the Word of God. How sad that they ever lost it to begin. That's, it's, it's not a sad thing that somebody found the Bible. It's a sad thing that it had been lost and gone for so long. Uh, thank God he had a promise that it would never be destroyed. So they found it intact. They found it. But, uh, but how sad that it was lost to begin with. And so here, <clears throat> one of the things that, <clears throat> that I'm supposed to do is to lead you to a place where God can speak to you. And, and conversely, I'm supposed to provide a place where God speaks. Years ago, one guy I just don't feel like I'm being fed here. And I asked my dad about that. I said, what? He said, well, is anybody else getting anything from the preaching? I said, yeah, other people say, thanks, I needed that. That helped me. That answered this question, that question. He said, will you tell that other fella to turn... Uh, instead of bringing his feet bucket and turning it upside down and sitting on it to get off of it and turn it right side up again. Uh, he's more likely to catch something in it that way. Uh, but, uh, and, and I, uh, you know, I understand <clears throat> that I might be saying something that you already know. And, uh, and that's okay. Somebody else might not. Uh, or it might be something that, yeah, I already know that, but I kind of needed reminded of it. Um, I had a, I had a, a a class years ago, um, a concealed carry class that I taught, and one of the one of the students had uh, had been in that never again volunteer yourself in the Navy, and uh, and I thought, and, and he had shot all his life. They lived out in the country and hunted squirrel and hunted deer, and and just he had been around guns his entire life, and and I kind of thought, I wonder if really there's anything because the the class is a very very basic class uh, and uh, <clears throat> I thought is he really going to learn something here and um, 
at the end, there's a questionnaire that I hand out, and at the last question is, what could have been done better? Uh, and he's, he wrote, I like biscuits. <laughs> and I think the next class, my wife made some homemade bread or something and, and brought it in. But anyhow, um, one of the things that he said was, I didn't really learn anything new, but it hit a reset button. I had become lax in my handling of the gun and wasn't as safe as I should be. And he said, so that hit a reset button for me. And I said, that's, uh, for me, that's worth the whole, if, if that's all I accomplished with you, then, then it's well worth it. Uh, and for everyone in his household, if he's being careless with a gun in his own household, that puts them and, and himself in great danger. But anyway, so, so it, it might be one of those things. It's just a reset button. Something you already knew, but sometimes we still need to be reminded of something that we already know. And, and so, but it should be a place where God speaks to you. And that should be a place. So sometimes in the preaching, that's what I'm doing. I'm encouraging you to, to be in a place where God can speak to you. In a place where the noise of the world is to be shut off. So if I say, hey, shut off the cell phones. I'm not doing that to be mean. I'm not doing that to pick on you. I'm doing that to, to calm the noise of the world down so that when God does speak, He can be heard. That's the wonderful thing about Bible camp. Nope, no cell phones, none of those things. Don't bring books from, from, bring your Bible, bring a notebook, and bring a pen. And those are, those are the only two books you need, a blank notebook, a Bible, and, and a pen, or if you prefer a pencil, uh, bring that. And, and for five days, there's no TV, there's no radio, there's no texting, there's no Facebook, there's none of that. It's the only thing they get to hear from is the preaching of God's Word, and they get that three or four times a day. And then there's activities to keep them physically tired and not enough energy to get into trouble. Although, if you're not real good at that, some of those teenagers find enough energy. Uh, but, uh, and so just don't give them the time to do it. And, uh, and then if they do find somehow some energy and some time, have some work to, to give them to work off that excess energy that they had. Uh, but uh, uh, it's a place where they can hear. And so when I take young people to camp, is I'm taking them to a place where they can hear God speak to them. And so many young people have surrendered to full-time service, have given their lives to serve God in a full-time capacity as a pastor or as a Christian school principal or as an evangelist or as a missionary or as a song leader or, or something along those lines. And it's happened at Bible camp. That's where I first surrendered and said, Lord, I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then I came back where there was a lot more noise and I forgot all about my promise. I forgot all about my giving myself to God. It's not where I got saved, but that's where I said, God, you can have my life and you can, you can do whatever you want with it. Then years and years and years later, I did it again. And then not long after that, I remembered I had done this before. I, I remember the, the camp where I was. And um, I'm thankful well, God didn't forget. You know, if you tell God, I'll do whatever you want, he remembers that. And he thought, he just goes on, you meant it. He doesn't say, ah, they don't really mean it. He says, okay, I'll take you at your word. And he'll move things in your life to move you in that direction. But one of my jobs is to move you in the direction of being in a place where God can speak to you. And that might be encouraging you to go to a, a, a revival or to go to this conference or go to here or go to there. Uh, take young people to Bible camp. And, and, and that's, a, that's, that's, part of, that's one of the places where I'm supposed to lead you to. And, and so we have a different service on Sunday night. We have a different service on Wednesday night. There's different directions that we kind of go during those times. But it's all in a place where God can speak to you. The next place they went is Jericho. Verse 4, back in 2 Kings 2, And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. Now what's Jericho? Jericho is the place of victory. The place of victory. Turn with me. 
uh, and you may want to put a bookmark here, but uh, let's go back to the book of Joshua, chapter 6. Joshua, chapter 6. Joshua, chapter 6. And verse 17. <clears throat> and it says this, And the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come in. Uh, they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. This is a place of victory. This is the place of victory. Now, the Israelites have had many struggles over the last uh, 41 and a half years, and, and just, uh, they had had some battles, some small skirmishes. The enemies would kind of, bandits would raid the encampment, and they'd, they'd uh, have to repel them a little bit. But this is the first really big battle. I mean, this is the first odds stacked very heavily against them battle. I mean, if they had compared all the victories that they had had, including this one, they would have said, this is the big one. This is the most exciting. When they were talking to their grandkids about the difficulties, struggles, and battles, they said, wish you could have been there when Jericho fell. And here's how it happened. I mean, this is, this is the, the one that songs are still being written about. And the, Joshua, I, I hated that Joshua fit. The battle of Jericho? No, he fought the battle of Jericho. <laughs> but that was, uh, if you look, that's the way it's written. And uh, I hated having to sing it wrong. Uh, it just kind of grated with me. But that was the way the, the song was. Anyways, um, that's the big one. That's the big, that's the first great victory under Joshua's direct leadership. And Elijah says to Elisha, I'm going to go over here to Jericho. And Elisha says, I, I need to know about victories. And so one of the things that, that a pastor wants to do and one of the places he wants to lead the Christian is to a place of victory. I mean, you should have a place where you hear from God and where you have heard that call from God to, first of all, get saved. That call to be born again. And that's the, that's the first thing people will hear from God is something to move them in the direction. When Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and he said, Master, we know that there are prophets come from God. And Jesus said, let me take you to a place. There's a message I have for you. Ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and so he, he took him to a place where he was hearing I mean, anybody that listened to Jesus and anything he said was hearing the very words of God spoken, perhaps the first time where they were heard, they were written down forever in heaven, but they were spoken and heard for the first time there. And, and uh, uh, anything he said, those are the words of God, even if they weren't written down, because he is God himself. And, and so the, the, the next place is, after you get saved, we want to see you have victory. We want to see you overcome the things that, that you were enslaved to before. And whatever vice and whatever, whatever thing that is, you know, somebody, they said, I'm have, having a real hard time getting control over my tongue. I want to help you get that, that victory. I'm having a real hard time. Uh, uh, <laughs> one guy uh, visited, he lived uh, closer to Mansfield than he did here. And, and I don't really know how he found out, about, but he showed up one night. And uh, Sunday night, I think it was, and uh, <clears throat> came back later again with his wife, and I went out to visit him, and he told me how he had gotten saved, and and um, wound up in a church where where the pastor was, he was smoking, and not hiding it, and he wasn't sneaking and smoking. Everybody knew the pastor smoked. Now, as an unsaved man, he always knew that's that's not you ought not to do that. That's Christians don't smoke. 
And so he asked the pastor, he said, I thought Christians didn't smoke. And, the, and the, here's what that preacher said to him. It's not what goeth into the mouth that defileth a man. I said, okay. So how did he get away with not exhaling? Because <laughs> it's, it says, it's what comes out of the mouth that defileth a man. So he was quoting a, a verse there to try to justify being able to smoke. And I said, well, does he exhale through the ears or, or how how's that work? And so maybe he thought as long as he only inhaled through the mouth and exhaled through the nose, he was okay, and that's how he justified it. And, mm -hmm. But everybody knows. And so that pastor was not leading him. If he, had been, if he had been someone enslaved to tobacco himself, that pastor was not leading him to the victory over that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect and I can, I can take you to all the places where I can have a victory or where I've had a victory or... Or that if I haven't had a victory there, I can't, you know, well, preacher, you've never smoked. How can you lead me to the victory? I can lead you to the one that gives, gives you the victory. Mm -hmm. And it's the God of this Bible that gives all victory. If we have a victory over anything, and well, I have a temper, well, God can give you the victory over that and give you bring that under submission and under control. Well, I, I have a problem with alcohol. Well, God can, and you know, that's not something I'm interested in at all. I'm just, uh, uh, I, I try, I, I started and, and quit smoking all in the same puff. <laughs> and so I'm not at all interested in that. I don't look at people smoking cigarettes and think, wow, that's pretty cool. I can't wait till I can do that. I can't wait till I'm grown up enough to, to buy a pack of cigarettes. And uh, you know, people used to think they were cool when they rolled it up in their sleeve. And, uh. I can't wait till I can do that. And there's a lot of kids that, that look at tobacco that way. And they think it's a grown-up thing to do. They think it's a cool thing to do. And, and uh, I just decided coughing and hacking and choking didn't impress anybody. <laughs> Especially when everybody that was there that had pressured me into, into smoking were all laughing at me over the whole thing. I said, I don't know how to get them to stop laughing. I'll be lung cancer free. <laughs> and, and that day, my parents started getting smarter in my sight. And, and uh, the older I get, the smarter my parents get. And, but uh, there should be, a, my goal is to lead people. You, you're struggling with something? Let me take you. I might not know what that's like. I might not know that particular struggle. But I know that there's a God in heaven, a God of this book that's bigger than that struggle. And my job is to lead you to that victory and help you to get the victory that the Israelites got at Jericho. Mm -hmm. And he, let's look at that for a little bit. Joshua said, all right, I just talked to God. And here's the plan. Because we know there's giants in Jericho and us compared to them kind of makes us feel like grasshoppers. We know that. We know Jericho has a huge wall. We know that. And we don't have anything to make ladders big enough for those walls. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to line up and we're going to walk around those walls. Quiet. No talking. And so I kind of put my, myself in the shoes of the listener. All right. We're going to sneak up on them. Then what? Then we're going to come back home. Okay, maybe we're just scoping, finding weak spots. Uh, the next day, we're going to do the same thing. And the next day, and the next day, and, and then on the last day, some of us are going to have trumpets. And some of us are just going to yell, because I've heard you try to play the trumpet. No, I don't know. <laughs> and the rest of us are just going to yell. Preacher, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Really? We're just going to walk around, walk around, walk around. And then I kind of put myself in the shoes of the people on top of the wall looking down. <laughs> Are you going to walk us to death? <laughs> what the, you're not doing anything down there. You're not accomplishing anything down there. And the world will laugh at the Christian who's, who's making advances in his life. The world will laugh at the Christian who's following biblical instructions in his life. But God always has the last laugh.
to that last event, that victory was phenomenal. I mean, here's a wall. The, the people of Jericho had their faith in the wall. God will destroy everything that your faith is in that's not Him. Think about that. It will be taken from you. Well, my faith is in this. Well, that's going to fail unless your faith is in God. Put your faith in God first. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, I've got cancer, my faith is in God, and, and that's all it's going to take. No, that's not what that means. That means you start with God, and God says, oh, here's something that will help you. It's kind of like that fellow that the waters were flooding, and they had issued evacuation notices, and the water came up to his front door, and a little boat came by and they knocked on the door and said, get in, There's, it's going to be a lot higher. Your house is going to be underwater the next few hours. And he said, no, I prayed. God's going to take care of me. And he got up to the second story of the house and somebody came by and knocked on the window upstairs and they said, here, get in the boat. we got to get out of here. There's more coming. He said, I prayed and, and God's going to take care of me. Finally, he got up to the rooftop and he's up on top of the roof and the waters are still ri rising up, rising up. A boat comes by and says, man, you got to get in because it's still going to be another six or seven feet. And, and the, the, the waters are running faster and faster. He says, no, I prayed to God and he's going to take care of me. Finally, the water got about waist high on him and the helicopter comes by. And they lower a rope with a, a harness on the bottom of it. They said, climb in that thing and we'll raise you up and take you to safety. He says, don't worry, I prayed to God and he's going to take care of me. And the waters keep rising and he drowns. And he gets to heaven and says, God... I prayed and expected you to take care of me. And God said, I don't know what went wrong. I sent three boats and a helicopter. <laughs> what are you doing here? And so I'm not talking about having this, uh, I just prayed to God and he's going to take care of it all. You pray to God and you, have, and you put your faith in him, yes, but he will direct you somewhere and you have to follow that direction. He'll provide something. He'll open a door for you and you actually have to take the, the steps and walk through that door. And so the, the instructions they got, those instructions from any military perspective, make absolutely no sense. I mean, sometimes generals will read books about past battles, historical battles, so that they can get, here's what that general did, and here's what worked, and here's what didn't work, and they can learn, and they can plan their own, their own battles and plans of attack, and nobody studies Joshua at Jericho to find out how to win a battle. That's not, what are we going to do? We're going to do the same thing Joshua did. Said, no general ever. <laughs> Remember Joshua at Jericho? Get, this, get, the, get the band together and have them bring their trumpets. And get the loudest yellers. And so, it, it, preach, that doesn't make sense. Okay. That doesn't change anything. Somebody could have gone to Joshua afterwards and said, I'm not trying to be contrary or anything. I just don't understand. And Joshua might have said, I don't either. But I know it's what God said. There's things in here, i got to be honest with you, I don't understand it. But I know it's what God said. And it's my job to say, thus saith the Lord. And we don't have to understand it. I've, I've used this illustration before. I don't understand how... Flipping that light switch makes the lights come on. I know it does. I know they say the electrons bounce from one atom to the next and they just keep knocking the one off the other end and it, it, that's how it flows through the wires. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but how does that, so it comes, here's my basic, I'm going to give you a, in about 45 seconds, my basic understanding of electricity. It comes from the pole through a wire and it runs through whatever you want it to run through and then goes down in the dirt. Is it, uh, I don't know, Brother Mike knows more than I do about it and he's laughing, so I'm wrong. <laughs> but I know somehow it ends up in the dirt because you've got to put a 10 foot spike down in the dirt. And all your lines have to end up there. I, I don't know. And so I could be way off on that. But uh, but I know when I flip that switch, I have an expectation for the lights to come on. And so far, they do, unless the breaker's been flipped or something like that. But uh, uh, I don't have 
have to understand it, but it works. I don't fully understand salvation, but I know I'm saved. I don't fully understand baptism, but I know God said, you should be baptized. Don't even get me started on tithing. How does 90% last longer than 100% God's power? I just know it does. I just know it does. And so, the same place that the preacher will ever try to lead you is a place of victory. See, those, those instructions, I, I, they just don't make sense to me. That's okay. It might be the instructions I'm giving you don't make sense to me. But God said that without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And so when, here's what you have there is an opportunity. If it makes sense to you, you don't have this opportunity. It's when it doesn't make sense, you have an opportunity to say, you know what, it doesn't make sense to me, but God said it, I'm just going to trust Him on it. That's faith. God said it, and based on what He said, I'm just going to trust Him on that. Hey, that old fella, he, he'd find a promise in the Bible, and he'd claim that promise and get his prayers answered. And he, he went to his pastor and said, I just love the promises of the Bible. He said, I needed this over here, and I found a promise in the Bible, and so I, I, I prayed to God, and I pointed out that promise to him, and I got it. And then I needed something else done over here, and, and I found a promise in the Bible, and I went to God, and I prayed, and the pastor said, those promises are for us. Well, how do you get your prayers answered, preacher? Well, I don't get a whole lot of my prayers answered. That old fellow said, I like my way better. <laughs> He just said, God said it, I'm just going to believe it. And it was working. Shame on that pastor for trying to destroy something that was actually working spiritually right and good in this man's life. And he caused, he, he, he cast doubt on the word of God. Don't ever catch yourself doing that. That's, I'll tell you, and I'm not kidding here, that's a dangerous thing. Because it's the Word of God that helps people get closer to God, helps people get closer to Jesus, especially on a child. Because God said, you'd be better off having a millstone tied around your neck and to be thrown into the water, into the sea, than to do something that would keep a child from coming to Jesus and cast doubt in that child's mind about God and about the Savior. Uh, that's free. Um, but one of the things that the preacher is attempting to do in the preaching and in the leading and guiding and, and counsel, is to take you to a place where you first hear from God, when you hear about your need of salvation, and when you can continue to go and continue to hear from God and to take you to a place of victory. Let's look at the last place they went, and that is in verse 6, back in uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee hear, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. Now Jordan, let's, let's read on here. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they, they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. Now, They've come to the bank of Jordan. Elijah splits it open. The ground is dry. And Elijah starts to walk. And Elisha is, is with him. He's behind him. But he has, a, he has a decision to make here. If I go over, I'll be separated from everything that's on this side. Over well, here's the place where I hear from God. Well, but here's the place where I've learned about victories. I'll be separated from the sons of the prophets, the other preachers. I don't know what's over there. I know God's taken him away from me today. And if we get over there and this river starts flowing again, what then? Jordan is the place of complete commitment and complete faith in God. It's where you give your all. And I don't mean that you give all that you have. 
I mean you give all that you are. Or you give all of yourself. All of me is going over there. And I'm just going to trust God for everything. So it's, it's a, not just a place of victory, it's a place of commitment and complete faith. And so that's, you know, here's a, here's a sad truth. In, in a majority of churches, when the pastor leaves, the attendance goes down more than just the number of the pastor's family. Which means the people are in church partially for the wrong reason. Now, I'd rather you be here for the wrong reason than to be gone and think it was the right reason. Because if you stay long enough, I'll try to lead you from having the wrong reason to having the right reason. And, and, and we saw it in Columbia. We, <clears throat> Dad would get a church started and then we'd come home on furlough and then go back down and where's half the people? Well, you know, the American left and so they quit going. Why? They were going because of who the preacher was. Not because they had made a total commitment to God. Part of their commitment was still to my dad. And in so many churches, part of the commitment is to the pastor or his family or, or some, something in that regards. And the pastor goes to another church and they say, well, you know, we, <laughs> it's odd how two weeks earlier, God had led them to the church where they're at. And now that the pastor's gone, God made a mistake. I wonder if God knew that pastor was going to leave when he told me to come here. <laughs> and it came a shock. It was not a shock to him. God called you there anyways. I heard a preacher, he said, uh, he didn't say this to me, I heard about him saying it. To another pastor, he said, I think it's time for me to move on. I think I've, I've taught the people of that church, everything I can. And that pastor said, you stay right where you're at. They haven't taught you everything they can. <laughs> and, <laughs> you need a little more patience. But the last place is that place of commitment. And you know what? God took care of Elisha. As Elijah is going up, that mantle falls down. And Elisha picks up that mantle and goes back to the river, smacks it. And now he has what he needed to face the journey of his life. He knows I need to have a place where God speaks to me. I need to have experienced victory from God's power. And I've made a total and complete commitment. And Elisha went on to do double the miracles that Elijah did. He got what was promised to him. Because he stayed. He said, I'm going to follow, I'm going to follow, I'm going to follow. Was Elijah perfect? No. No, he wasn't. In fact, Elijah, at one point, had been depressed and suicidal. Thank God he listened to God during that time and let God lead him and, and help him through it. Uh, but that's that's a that's a spiritual satanic attack. And he was he was starting to sink. Got all depressed, sat down under the tree and just uh, better off dead. King's wife hates me. Man up, uh, man. And it's easy to say, really? You got some woman chasing you down, scaring you? You faced all the prophets of Baal just a few hours ago, and now she makes some stupid little threat, and you're afraid of her? Well, I'm not allowed to hit back on her. <laughs> and he, he did. He got suicidal and got depressed. And God had to send a, an angel and, and gave him some food, and he went three days in the power of that food. Wouldn't our army rations like to... Our military like to have that. We, our men can eat one meal and go for three days on the energy and strength from that one meal. It cut down on the cost of food big time. So no, Elijah wasn't perfect. He 
wasn't. But he knew, I've got to lead Elisha to the house of God where he can hear from God, to Jericho, and to the Jordan. Let's stand today, every head bowed, every eye closed. I, I don't claim to be perfect. I, I know I'm not. I know I'm not. But I do have a perfect God. I do have a perfect book from that perfect God. And as I open this book, more often than not, my goal and my desire is to lead you to a place where God speaks to you. To lead you to a place of victory. I can't, I can't give you the victory. I can't do it for you. But I can lead you to hold the hand of the one that can. And my goal is to lead you to always hold that hand. I'll stand here today and without any doubt in my mind proclaim that God can get you through anything you will ever have to face and more and more and I can share testimony after testimony and testimony of my own and my wife's of God's power getting us through things that we thought we're not going to be able to make it through this we're not going to be able to, there's, we can't go on somehow God got a message to us telling us, you can go on. You can go on. Get up and take another step. Get up and take another step. And you keep... It doesn't matter how many times you fall, as long as the time, the number of times you get up is one more. And with God, it can always be one more. And there's nothing so discouraging to the enemy as a fighter who just will not stay down. When he gives you your best shot and knocks you on your back and you get up, that's discouraging to him. You just keep getting up. You just keep getting up and keep moving forward. There's nothing so big that you can't face with God. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this little, <clears throat> these just few verses. And it looks on the surface just, well, they're going from one town and just telling us what town they went to next and what place they went to next and who they visited with while they're there. But there's so much more tucked in there. Such powerful truths. God, help us. Help me as I do my best to lead to those places. And help all of us do our best to follow and go to those places and learn how to get there ourselves and then to lead others there as well. Bless this invitation. Lord, whatever you've been dealing with in people's lives, may that be brought to an altar today and given over to you. Some folks may need to be better acquainted with the place where God speaks to them. There may be some searching for a victory. There may be some that are at the border, the, the edge, the banks of Jordan. And they're facing a decision to stay here or over on the other side, not knowing how they might be able to get back. God, help them to go ahead and make that total commitment to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. It's a piano plays. God's spoken your heart about something. Maybe you've been wavering about something. Do I, do I cross over this Jordan? Or do I hang back over here? Maybe you're in need of a victory. Something you've been struggling with. God will help you get that victory. Faith is the victory.
that you'll take us to our home safely and that you'll remind us of the truths we've heard today. That they'll work their way into our hearts and into our minds and <clears throat> that they will strengthen us and, and draw us closer to you. That we might be used by you to point lost souls in a, in a dark and destructive and hateful world. That we may be able to point them to Jesus, that they may receive the light of salvation from Him. For we do ask it all in His name, for His sake. Amen. Lord bless you.